Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Wellman's Podcast. Um, I'm here with my co-host, Brian, and we're very excited about our guest, Dr. Sanita Iyer. Um, just a little bit about her. She's a graduate of the University of Chicago. That's where she did her undergrad. And I think after that, worked for several years in a residential program in Boston, uh, working with pregnant and parenting uh, teenage women, just helping them, giving them a guiding light, and then uh, got her doctorate, medical doctorate, naturopathic doctorate at Bastyr University, and right now is currently teaching at Bastyr University, as well as the University of Washington in the School of Nursing and Health Sciences. Congratulations on this. Dr. Sunita recently has been elected as co-president of the Midwives Association of Washington State. Wow. Currently Congratulations. Her and her, yeah, currently her and her partner, John Paul. By the way, John Paul's my favorite acupuncturist of all time, but currently her and her partner, John Paul, run Eastside Naturopathic Medicine. It's an integrative, comprehensive health clinic. It also acts as a teaching clinic for Bastyr University students and other healthcare providers located in Seattle. Um, as a midwife and naturopathic physician, she has assisted and delivered thousands of babies. She is currently one of the few naturopathic pediatricians and midwives in the U.S. and I, I would say even the world because there's not many physicians that have her, her skill set. So today we're going to be talking about natural childbirth and this is why I wanted uh, Dr. Sunita on to help educate all of us and I'm very curious about this uh, topic myself since my wife and I are hopefully going to have a baby soon. So this is really good in, in, you know, information for me. So welcome, Dr. Sunita. Thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I guess, <laughs> I guess I wanted to start with, I mean, when, when I hear natural childbirth, what, what does that actually mean? Because does that just mean vaginal birth as opposed to cesarean? I mean, I, I don't know, or home birth as opposed to something else? Well, I think it depends on who you're talking to. Um, that's probably the biggest question in all of this is what do people mean? Um, I mean, when people come to me, one of the things they say is, oh, I want a natural birth. So that's my first question. What do you mean by that? Hmm. Um, it can mean that people want it to be, you know, at home with candles and, you know, absolutely no complications, which is, you know, all well and good, but birth does what it does. Um, it could mean that it happens in a hospital, but the baby comes out vaginally and that's what they mean by it. Um, a lot of people use that term natural childbirth if they mean, um, they don't want an epidural, Okay. but it doesn't always mean place of birth. Okay. Okay. Um, but I will say that as people are learning more about birth centers and home births and out of hospital birth altogether, then definitions changing a little bit, but most people, when I talk to them, just, you know, in my community or through pediatric practice, they're like, oh, I want a natural birth. They just mean they want to try without an epidural. Okay. Doesn't mm -hmm. the, doesn't each state law kind of help define that too, in a sense, because I, mm -hmm. I know like home births are, not, at least here in North Carolina, are not considered legal or there's no, or they're illegal. There's no, there's nothing written on the books about it. Yeah, I mean, every state, I mean, that's the interesting thing about the United States is that we have sort of federal laws and then every state gets to make their own laws about some of those things as well. And midwives and, well, childbirth attendants, I should say, are one of those things. So mm -hmm. obstetricians, midwives, you know, there's all different types. And each state licenses midwives totally differently. There are some okay. states, like you were saying, North Carolina, um, uh, Indiana, I think, is still one of them. There's one or two others where it is illegal to, to illegal. Basically, if you are caught practicing midwifery, so you're attending births, for the most part, what we mean outside of the hospital, um, and essentially providing maternity care and obstetric care, you know, you're, you're providing medical care, um, you could be, um, well, I guess I should say, if there's an outcome that um, mm -hmm. isn't so great, um, yeah. then you could actually be held accountable for practicing medicine without a license. Um, and it might actually result in criminal charges in some states and has. Yeah. yeah. Um, Washington state where I am has some of the most progressive laws and a lot of what we do politically, legislatively, um, and just even scope of practice wise in Washington has kind of started to become a little bit of a template for what other midwives do around the country, which is pretty cool. Okay. That's cool. So, 
I guess if somebody is wanting to have a home birth or outside of a hospital birth, how would they go about doing that? I would, I imagine a lot of people don't even know where to go for that. And if there's no laws on the books, then how do they know they're getting a credentialed, properly trained <laughs> midwife? Um, it's tough. I'll be quite okay. honest. I mean, I think that that's the, the hard part about midwifery right now in the United States. Um, just it's sort of cultural status and then it's legal status is then the consumer protection piece. People don't always know what they're, what they're getting. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll say that in Washington, what's in, we're actually having this discussion right now because we're formulating our legislative agenda for this upcoming session. So to meet with all of our state senators and representatives. Right. Um, and one of the things that's still on our books in Washington is that someone can use the term midwife to describe what they do, but in as long as they don't um, contract for money, like for instance, it could be in exchange for, um, you know, I'll provide, child care for your children or something like that, where it's actually just an exchange of services, um, it's, it's still protected under the law. Um, okay. So it's interesting that there are, um, there are a lot of different ways that people can still practice, even in states that have really well-defined scopes and laws. Um, but it actually also has resulted in some consumer issues where people haven't really known um, that they hired somebody who wasn't a licensed midwife um, and who didn't actually have any formal training. Um, so there's definitely a lot of questions that I have people ask if they're going to look into midwife, you know, midwifery practice or care for their family is, mm -hmm. you know, where do they, where do they deliver babies or catch babies? Um, what's their training and what's their licensure? Um, cause it is pretty hard to know what, what you're going to get. Um, and a lot of states around the country, um, that's still very much protected, like what they call traditional midwifery or lay midwifery. Um, which wow, doesn't mean okay. that those people don't have experience, you know, it just doesn't, it likely means that they don't have a formal education around midwifery. Um, so, but some of those people have been catching babies for 30 years. Is there not like an accrediting body like there mm -hmm. is for naturopaths or physical therapists? Or there is? There, there is actually. Um, okay. There's a national accrediting body. There's, you know, um, not just for licensure. So the NACPM, um, which kind of provides a, creden a national credential. Um, there's also an educational accrediting body, Meek. Um, so there's, you know, well-established stuff out there for out-of-hospital midwives. But, you know, this is a conversation we have amongst us midwife people. We're maybe a, a little bit rebellious in our nature. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe we're people who, you know, I don't want anybody telling me what to do kind of people. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I think it definitely attracts a certain personality. I'll be quite honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely why I've always said, even though I also hold this license as a naturopathic doctor, I am a midwife. Right. Um, you know, like right now I am um, taking a break from catching babies, but I am and always will be a midwife. You know, that's, that's my heart. That's my core. Right. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with the kind of people that come to this work. You gotta be a little bit cuckoo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and be able to stay up all night for many nights. And you'll in stay a row. up all night long. And, you know, have a party at your house the night before you do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'd imagine that's a factor though, as a midwife. I mean, just getting burnt out. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you're really delivering babies, you never know when that baby's coming. You constantly have to be on call, I would imagine. And you mm -hmm. probably have many, many sleepless nights. <laughs> to yeah, that, right. Yeah. I mean, I would say that, I mean, I'm well trained in a lot of things and sleep deprivation is definitely one of them. <laughs> um, it's, it's torture. Okay. I mean, to be quite honest, uh, there, I mean, I can remember times now, like physically, I can, I can feel the sensation in my body, like as I'm talking about it, of like having been up for four days straight. <laughs> and it literally feels like someone's torturing you. I mean, oh, that slowly, is torture. Pulling off your fingernails with pliers um, <laughs> would be a, a better fate, really. Wow. Um, and, yeah, well, it literally speaks to you. That brings me to the next point, then, because a lot of conventional docs, OBGYNs, I mean, they they basically schedule the births, right? So they don't have to deal with that. Yeah. I mean, that would be one aspect, right? that they can, they can deliver that baby according to their schedule. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that there's been some consumer pushback, at least in some states. You know, again, I always have to own that I live in this little bubble up here in Pacific Northwest of, um, well, not just education level, formal education level, but a lot of people who are very actively seeking education about their health and their care and all those things. Mm -hmm. Um, So people definitely push back on that in our area hospitals, but it happens. Right. Around the country, it's definitely still a phenomenon. You know, if you're working with someone and it's Thursday, 5 p.m., they're like, hey, we could do this. Mm -hmm. Stay overnight. You guys could be home for the weekend, you know? Right. Um, And, uh, and that, yeah, that definitely still happens. And it, you know, it also appeals to consumers. (laughs) Right, right. Oh, yeah, sure. I have families that, um, you know, if with two work full-time working people, if they're like, if I knew this baby was just going to come Thursday night, I just had to take Friday off and, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is the, you know, non-birthing person. Like, and then I could go back to work on Monday. That'd be great. Yeah. Wow. Um, now, can a midwife work alongside the standard medical people at a hospital? N- not really. Okay. So, and that is, uh, there are a lot of different pieces to that. Um, it's a hospital, like administrative policies, primarily. Yeah. Sure. Um, about what kinds of licensures are permitted in hospitals. It, we did have one midwife in this area um, who was actually had hospital privileges for a while. And one of the issues was that because we, as out of hospital attendants, don't typically manage epidurals. So, you know, the pain relief that they put in the spine and then, you know, um, it kind of just relaxes the lower part of the body. Um, they, they had a really difficult time having her manage births in the hospital. Um, because and that meant that an anesthesiologist had to be on all the time. So then the hospital had to have a certain, you know, payout um, mm-hmm. to have someone there to be her, you know, sort of attending with her all mm-hmm. the time. And this was a small area hospital, which is why they brought her in, because they wanted more collaboration in this rural area. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there were lots of administrative policies. People could also potentially think more um, creatively about how this could work. Mm -hmm. Um, It works pretty flawlessly in Canadian provinces um, and all throughout the Netherlands. So attendants attend out of hospital, birth centers, hospitals, and they flow very fluidly through all of those arenas. So when you hire a midwife, for instance, in British Columbia, um, that that midwife can attend your birth at home in a birth center or at the hospital. Um, and so the training is also separate. And so part of the problem is also that we do have all these different types of licensure right. um, and therefore different types of training. And some might say, well, maybe if we just had one training, then this would be a non-issue. But there's other political aspects to that too. Um, there's definitely a real strong um, vested interest in keeping birth in the hospital too. Right. Now, what is the difference between, because we, I'm very uneducated about midwife yeah. and we had a doula come on previously mm-hmm. and oh, so that yeah. was kind of my my intro into this and so what is the difference between a doula and a midwife good question i think that's probably the one we've healed all the time um so doulas are different than midwives in that they are providing mental emotional physical support but no clinical care mm-hmm. um so they are not managing um, say blood work or blood pressure or the heart tones of the baby. Um, like so when we're monitoring the heartbeat during labor, um, but they are providing all of the physical, mental, emotional support, which, you know, when a person is laboring, it definitely requires a lot. Um, I mean, the best uh, analogy I can think of is a marathon. I mean, like these people are running for fun by choice, right? And whole cities show up and bring them food and drink and play right. music and cheer. And for some reason, we think that when you're creating a human and getting it out of your body that doesn't need even like a little bit of support, it's just very interesting. <laughs> you know, like, why would a little cup of Gatorade. Do, uh, why would I need a support person? I mean, like, are you kidding me? You want 5,000 people to show up when you run a race, but you don't think that when you make a human, you need even like one person who's on your team. Yeah. Um, and what I love about doulas is they're also able to really well support partners and other family members. Yeah. Um, because also what happens is that as a midwife, you know, you see you're managing the clinical stuff. So in a situation where the labor is really tough and you're reassuring them from a clinical standpoint, like, but you know, she's great. Baby's great. Like everyone's doing fine, but let's see how we can get more support so that you can cope with what's normal because mm. 
normal birth is hard. Um, you know, just like normal life is hard. So it's not about like taking the hard out of it so much as it is helping people cope. And that's really where doulas come in and help reframe things for partners and families who are watching the person they love struggle. Yeah. And, and they're in their left brains, right? Like they're not in labor. They're like, what is going on? This, something is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Screaming, like this is, this is not cool, right? The right. first thing you want to do is fix that. And so, um, so I've worked with some really fantastic doulas who are so helpful and helping to like really also care for the family. Um, and then also I think about they're, they're there to also make other family members look really good, especially partners. Mm-hmm. Here, here's your cold washcloth. Here's your drink. Position the straw <laughs> this way. Put the cold washcloth here. Yeah, Don't talk stop. too much. Right yeah, after stop that podcast. Then, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think we both decided after the podcast that we would both need a doula when the time yeah, came yeah. for ourselves. Oh, oh absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. But okay, that paints that's that paints a clear picture of the differences. You know, you brought up something about. Uh, I guess uh, conventionally with birth, they want to try to, it seems like there's this push from the powers that be to keep birth in a hospital. Mm-hmm. And with that push, it seems there comes like a marketing aspect of putting fear out there. So mm-hmm. people stay in the hospital. And yeah. that whole fear being that birth is a very dangerous kind of a medical thing that's going on, even though you know, women have been doing it for, (laughs) you know, since humans have been on the planet. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, is, is it really dangerous? I mean, is it, is it a, is it a really a dangerous procedure or what makes it dangerous? What are the things that people have to know if it's a good choice for them or not? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's the crux of it right there is, you know, where, like, kind of who belongs in what arena is a big piece of um, midwifery, is like kind of like the underpinning of midwifery care. Because really when you think about out of hospital birth and it being safe and not dangerous, um, you're talking about low risk people okay. making use of that. Okay. Um, and low risk means like not having, um, you know, uh, high blood pressure mm-hmm. um, or severely uncontrolled diabetes. Um, or being immobilized in some way physically that would make it difficult, honestly, to be able, you know, if we had to move somewhere else or have someone in a tub and get them out to manage a complication. Um, So there are definite, so there are limitations sometimes in what we can offer from that perspective. They're not a possible standpoint, but also just period, make birth more dangerous. Like someone who has high blood pressure, um, is better off being managed in a hospital because the likelihood that that blood pressure could spike, for instance, in labor um, is much higher um, and could have really, really severe consequences for both the parent and the baby. Okay. Um, And so you want to be closer to emergency care in that situation. So that's, that's one piece of it, but you know, kind of the other piece of what you're saying is like, is birth inherently dangerous? I mean, the answer is yes. (laughs) (laughs) To some extent, you know, I don't disagree with that as a midwife because you're talking about life, right? So you're talking about death. Right. Um, I mean, so there's lots of midwife storytelling and history around midwifery about, you know, sort of when you're, when you do birth work, you do death work, Um, Mm -hmm. you do grief work. Um, And I'm really clear that that's what I do, you know, that I have, um, because you sit on that, I don't know, border, (laughs) Right. <laughs> of two yeah. worlds, really. Um, so, and death feels dangerous to us as humans, right? I mean, clearly yeah. we were, are, we're wired for survival. Mm-hmm. That's one piece. Um, but the other thing about like the thought of doing, like making a choice to be somewhere that could potentially be more dangerous is another aspect that is not totally correct about birth. Okay. Okay. You know, that for low risk people, and this is actually really, really well demonstrated in the data and the research too. So this isn't just like, you know, my opinion, my stats, anything like that. This is actually very, very well demonstrated in, and not just in the United States, all over the world. That low risk people, whether they're in the hospital or out of hospital, um, do not have worse outcomes outside of the hospital. Meaning it's not that more babies die or more moms die. Because really when you've kind of, 
um, accounted for those risk factors that could put a mom or baby at risk and you just have you know healthy people birthing the arena doesn't actually change their outcomes at all okay. um, and in fact if anything it actually improves their outcomes in terms of them being at lower risk for postpartum depression having higher rates of breastfeeding if that's they you know what they want to do um, so there's actually a lot of positive outcomes from right. being able to free care from that perspective but you know the cultural prevailing cultural belief is that birth is dangerous um, and people don't know that there's like this risk stratification thing that like there is such a thing as low risk middle risk high risk and mm -hmm. that's potentially what makes it dangerous it's not the arena itself mm -hmm. um, but also you know the history of midwifery is that um, you know midwives have been in cultures forever right mm -hmm. so I mean in the United States Native Americans and um, and Black Americans have always had traditional midwifery as part of their cultural and communal practices. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of what we did with the whole movement of conventional medicine to hospitals, you know, really like in the 40s and 50s, is we took birth away from communities and from community attendants. And we said who could go and where it needed to happen. Um, so we also took practices away from communities um, not unlike a lot of things that we took from those communities in this country. Right. Um, so that's also part of the history of midwifery too. You know, when we talk about like why it is where it is and why people think it should have, you know, why birth should happen where we think it should happen. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of layers to that too. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, yeah, I guess based on what you're saying, it's almost like, you know, slowly breaking down the community mm -hmm. cohesiveness with the chipping away at stuff like that and medicalizing all yeah. this stuff yeah and we could talk yeah. we could do a whole podcast on that yeah sure. yeah exactly you know how yeah. we've changed traditional medicine and made it a bad word and you know right right and modern medicine refers to you know only things that happen in highly medicalized settings right actually and that safe medicine only happens in those settings too which right and and let me let me clarify something also but uh you said traditional medicine i mean when when most people say traditional medicine lay people they're talking about conventional medicine when you're saying right. traditional medicine you're talking about the tradition of giving birth mm -hmm. like what ancient peoples all the way up until now with the you know midwifery uh, mm -hmm. natural childbirth as traditional yep yeah yeah the medicine i should say that has more history or tradition behind right it. right right yeah. yeah um yeah but you're right that word gets confused so yeah <laughs> Um, so you listed some some risks that would keep you out of the low risk group. One of them yeah. being blood pressure, diabetes. Um, mm -hmm. How does how does age play into that? How does like uh, miscarriage, yeah. previous miscarriages, or mm -hmm. you know just infertility issues? How does all that play into that risk? You know, so um, again, every state handles this slightly differently, okay. um, and because of that even midwives are subject to a lot of the same guidelines that obstetricians use, even though we don't necessarily practice with the same population. So it's sort of interesting. Right. But generally speaking, people consider birth um, for folks who are like 42 and older to be mm -hmm. more high risk. Okay, okay. Not so much that it would mean that that person couldn't birth out of the hospital. Right. But that's where the risk profile changes. Okay. But also consider that at about that age, um, uh, stereotypically, a lot more pe people in the country are also experiencing more health issues. Right. I see. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think that so it could be really it's not age all by itself that would right. count somebody out. Right. Um, and that the other health risks. So if a person who has like, doesn't take any medications, has no health problems, you know, and just is 41, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a high risk pregnancy. Although... The conversation that is going to happen with that person is that they are a ticking time bomb. Um, okay. And that is feedback that I have heard from all of the women I have worked with over the years who are like late 30s, early 40s, is that all they hear is that they are high risk. Right. Um, and I will say from my observation, um, you know, there's just our bodies get older, like biochemically at about 35, right? We're already starting like that aging and breakdown process. Right. Um, so labor is sometimes harder for even like super healthy people in their forties. Um, and I'll say the postpartum recovery is sometimes harder for people who are a little bit older. Right. Um, I think that also 
having a pretty high level of fitness is more unique. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I don't, I don't see a ton of people, you know, having babies in their forties who are super, super fit people, you know, right. so meaning like their physical recovery is actually pretty exceptional. Um, mm-hmm. but like we can't necessarily account for the uterus. Like, I don't really know how old, you know, someone's uterus is still 40 years old, you know, and what is that muscle like? Right. So, right. Yeah. So um, it's really individual. Just, it's really, really individual. But, um, but when you talk about like this age by itself rules somebody out there, a lot of the conversation will indicate that that's a rule out, but it's not. Okay. Um, and multiple miscarriages and fertility, those are, don't necessarily put anybody at higher risk unless the reason for those miscarriages is say a bleeding disorder or a uh, clotting disorder, I should say, you know, and then in which case that is the underlying absolutely. piece, not I the miscarriage, it. you know, or turns out the person did have, you know, malignant hypertension or, you know, high blood pressure that was um, not well managed. And that was the reason that they were abrupting and, you know, losing the pregnancies or something. Right. Um, then, but it's the blood pressure. That's the issue. Not the, not the okay. miscarriages. Yeah. I'd imagine midwives are, can kind of, are trained not in just catching babies. They, they mm-hmm. also have a, a lot of training in helping with fertility issues and, oh, yeah. you know, can start, can start managing patients way before they even decide to have a, have a baby, right? Yeah. I mean, and again, this is like state to state. Every, everybody does it so differently. Um, uh, it's not really in the scope of practice you know, in the, in terms of licensure for midwives, I mean, it really is like pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and that's it. Right. Um, and, but in a lot of other States where the scope is more gray or isn't really well defined, a lot of midwives actually do, um, provide a lot of preconception, not even necessarily like fertility care because they haven't figured out whether or not someone has struggled with that or not. Right. 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 A lot of preconception care, pre-pregnancy care. Okay. Um, because they serve that role in their community too. Okay. Wow. Um, the other thing is what about, so I get as a midwife, Mm -hmm. what, I mean, complications could come on immediately, right? As you're delivering, like you could see something come on immediately. Mm -hmm. Do you have to be, so what do you, I mean, what do you do if you have to transport (laughs) somebody to a hospital or need extra help? I mean, do you have somebody there with you? Do you have to mm-hmm. transfer them? What if, what if you're what in this rural area where the hospital is hours away? Yep. I mean, these are all great questions. I mean, it's the stuff that, you know, most families want to know, like, yeah. okay, so fine in low risk people, the actual likelihood that something um, emergent, like super, super urgent and complicated is going to happen is less than 1% of the time. Okay. Um, and that's in the hospital, out of the hospital. It's just that's statistically how that happens in low risk people. Okay. But if you happen to be in that like 0.5 to 1% people, um, and it's random, it very rarely, you know, those are the real random things. They very rarely have anything to do that with something that could have been predicted. Um, what do you do about it? And that's, you know, a huge part of our training yeah. as midwives is the emergency stuff, the complications. Yeah. Um, luckily you don't have to see them very often, but they happen. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, in every state, I mean, everyone has access to 911 and emergency services, right? But the way that midwives insert into that system varies greatly from state to state and honestly, community to community, even within the state, because in some areas, midwives and emergency medical personnel are really well integrated with each other. Um, and in other areas, they are hostile, um, and directly hostile, um, in that transfer. So you can imagine how that would impact somebody's care when somebody hostile shows up. Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, but that's mostly how it happens if it's emergent most of the time. So, you know, in a, in a given year where a midwife might catch 40 or 50 babies, you might have one emergency or zero, honestly, in that year. Okay. Um, and, but you still might transfer to the hospital maybe another 10 times, possibly even up to 15 times. Um, and most of the transfers are like 85 to 95% of the transfers are non-emergent, meaning we're calling ahead to the hospital and saying, hey, 
this person has been laboring for a while, you know, doesn't seem like things are changing. So, you know, now we're kind of on that, that very um, fine line between pain and suffering. Right. And we're coming in basically to get pain relief, you know, so the person can get an epidural, maybe get mm -hmm. some rest and then, and then go okay. on and birth their baby just in a different place. Right. So nothing complicated is happening. Mm -hmm. We're just changing how we're doing this. I see. Um, stereotypically, that's mostly first time parents. I mean, I've taken one third time parent for an epidural once because the birth was just kind of wacky like that. But, um, but mostly it's first time parents, you know, it's just a long, long labor. And at some point you're like, all right, you know, mom's fine. Baby's fine. Like nothing's happening. Everyone's blood pressure is fine. The baby's heartbeat's fine. Um, and we're just going in a really, relatively speaking, calm, cool, collected fashion. You know, we pack up <laughs> our stuff, we call ahead, you know, right. put them records because now we're all doing electronic charting. So I can, you know, fax the records through my computer, um, you know, so everybody's there and waiting. Okay. We get there, you know, they're met by the anesthesiologist. They get the epidural, you know, within an hour and a half, they're napping. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's mostly how it happens. And so much of how that, of like what it feels like and how, um, and how people are cared for has to do with that interface with the hospital emergency personnel. If there are good relationships and respectful relationships all the way around, people receive better care. Mm -hmm. And, and I have been in plenty of situations where that's been true more often than not, I'll say, um, on the flip side. I've also been in incredibly hostile situations um, with docs and emergency medical personnel and, um, and it's awful. And the people who suffer are the patients, the families. Yeah, I would think, you know, they think they're punishing me, you know, I, I mean, and I, I say that only just because I've received letters from doctors sometimes, mm -hmm. um, you know, who yeah. have stated essentially that thing. They think they're punishing me for like doing something bad by catching babies out of the hospital. Right. <laughs> Right, um, right. and really what they end up doing is they punish the family. Right. Um, Adds more and, stress to the family. It just, yeah. yeah. And it's traumatic for them, quite honestly, you know, yeah. because now all, everything changes in a heartbeat, right? Mm -hmm. They had this whole plan, you know, everything was happening like this. They know their care, like they picked a midwife or a midwife group. They've known their care providers the whole time. Everyone in the room is known to them. You know, it's a very, very carefully curated situation. Um, and a caring situation. And then all of a sudden they're like getting in cars, going to a new place with docs, nurses, admin people that they've never met before, you know, bright lights, lots of people talking at you, putting forms in front of your face. Like, so in case we have to do a C-section, you have to acknowledge that the mom and baby could die, you know, um, yeah. you know, and that's, they're literally putting that form under your nose while you're checking it. <laughs> while you're laboring too, huh? Yeah. While you're laboring. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah, I've been on the side of that as the birthing person. And I've been on the side of that as, you know, as a midwife. So my right. own birth, you know, was 56 hours long. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we were fine, you know, but at some point I was like, okay, this isn't changing. And, you know, yeah. what I need to do is rest and I can't get that. Yes. So why don't we go get some pain relief so I can sleep for a couple hours and we don't wait until I'm crapping out or the baby's crapping out. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. You know, you got to make those calls also. You know, I always talk to people about what we do as midwives is anticipatory care. Um, we don't have an operating room across the hall, right? I can't get your baby out with um, surgically in three minutes in your living room. Yeah. We have to go somewhere to get that. So I always have to think about 30 minutes to an hour in advance. Um, and very often many hours in advance. So to some extent, I have to be more prickly about what I'm hearing and seeing. Yes. Um, and even they, ha they get to be in the hospital. Um, and I can think of so many instances where like, I've heard one heartbeat where I'm like, that's different. That's the pattern's changing. And to me, what I'm thinking is in four hours or six hours, this baby could start decompensating and losing right. energy because they're working hard to get out. Right. Right. And I don't right. want to wait till this baby's heartbeat is consistently crappy. Yeah. And now we're going in for, now we're rushing in an ambulance to have an emergency C-section. I either want to go in sooner when everyone's calm, cool, collected, and the baby comes out healthy and happy. And maybe the baby could have been born at home, but it's better that everyone's healthy. Yes. Um, or I need to then make my assessment that much more precise about whether or not things are changing and there's progress happening at home or at the birth center 
so that I know that like, okay, if things aren't changing, like in the next 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour and set myself really clear parameters of when things have to change and what has to change, mm -hmm. um, then I'm making another plan. Right. Um, where on the flip side, I have taken babies in where I'm like, I heard the one or two heartbeats and I'm like, I don't like that. We get to the hospital. Um, and they just let mom keep laboring. And you see, so D cells are like literally decelerations or drops in the heartbeat, which mean that the baby's actually starting to get too tired mm -hmm. um, and is starting to decompensate. So, you know, the next thing that happens is that they're in distress. Right. And I've literally watched them watch the little like printout. Yeah. Um, and it's just like dropping, dropping, dropping with every contraction. And you're like, oh my God, somebody get this baby out of her body. <laughs> right. And they're like, well, you know, but the operating room is three, is they can have the baby out literally in three minutes flat. Yeah. You know, yeah. give her general anesthesia and then have the baby out. So they're not panicking in the same way. So it's sort of interesting that like there are some ways that we are overly cautious in an out of hospital setting because we have to be, right? Right. But like what happens when you're hours outside of a hospital? Um, like in Washington, I mean, Washington is mostly rural. Yeah. The midwives east of the mountains, I mean, are sometimes three hours from a hospital. Wow. Yeah. That has anyone that's even remotely skilled in obstetrics. And that they have to figure that into their timing too. That whole algorithm, the plan you're making, how quickly you need to see things change. Right. Um, that all has to get mapped out in their head. Like, all right, so if this isn't like 150% straightforward, I'm making another plan. Yeah. 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 That, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of planning then. Uh, there's a lot of planning, yeah. right? With the, the, with yeah. the parents, the midwife to, mm -hmm. to really uh, make sure that it's successful you know, and, and to, to make sure that it's safe and, you know, you're covering all your bases, I would imagine. So I'd imagine yeah. distance, distance plays a role then and whether you really want to do oh, this. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And we've had that conversation with a number of people like, look, you know, the, even though there might not be um, amazing data out there about what distance matters. I mean, when, when we talk about low risk and access to emergency care, generally you're talking about 30 minutes or less. Mm hmm. Wow. So, which, you know, for states like North Carolina, for a lot of states in the middle of the country, um, they might have one or two major hospitals in the entire state. Mm -hmm. And it is very reasonable to think that they're going to be like two or three hours from the hospital. Right. On the flip side, what's safer for them, you know, to try to get to a hospital, <laughs> you know, in labor or, you know. Yeah. Or not. So I think that, you know, people that figures into people's decisions too. Um, and then do they have other kids? Do they have help? You know, all that kind of stuff. You know, okay. is it safer, or more reasonable for them to be at home? Or do they have to literally go pick up and live, you know, in Bozeman for a week or something mm -hmm. like that? Okay. So Brian and I completely ignorant to what happens immediately after the okay. birth. So what, what happens right after the birth? The baby's out. But yep. what's the care then for the baby and for the mom, like immediately after everything's fine? Yeah. I always say that that's like when our work really starts, you know, okay. before the baby's out. I mean, obviously we're monitoring the baby and blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. But really, you know, the, you know, the person who's in labor is doing most of the work, right? Mm -hmm. And the baby's out and that's when we're on you know that's when our show really starts is that immediate postpartum okay. because the first thing you're i mean because now you have two patients right right um on the outside and you have and this is a very very vulnerable time this transition for both of them um the major issues are baby's breathing and mom's bleeding so you're ma you're managing both of those scenarios simultaneously uh -huh. um, so, I mean, I mean, when we're attending births, we have generally at least, at least one very well-trained assistant, like another midwife, um, or, um, or probably even two assistants with us very often. Um, so we, we will often already have divided up, okay, you're a mom, I'm on baby, you know, and then the third person is like, you're getting us all the stuff we want. Um, but those are the things that we're monitoring for. So in a straightforward situation, baby comes out, they look a little bluish, purple, gray, <laughs> um, they take a breath they cry and then they pink up and there's a whole bunch of other cool stuff that happens in their heart and their cardiovascular system in terms of all these valves mm -hmm. that were open that now all of a sudden close 
with the pressure change of having taken a breath because right. they weren't using their lungs on the inside. It was just amniotic fluid. So yeah. now they're using their lungs for the first time. Um, so stuff, you know, stuff happens when you're using any piece of equipment for the first time. Right. Um, sometimes it goes really well most of the time. And sometimes it takes a, little, a few moments. So you're making sure the baby's breathing and crying. Um, and typically we'll keep them connected to their, like, we don't cut the cord right away. We keep them connected. Yeah, to I was going to ask system. about that. Um, and now that is lots and lots of research and lots of hospitals are adopting the process, but midwives have always done it because the placenta is still attached on the inside to mom's body, to blood flow and to oxygen. So cutting the cord right away doesn't make any sense because that is actually one of the ways that the baby's getting oxygen while they're making this transition and practicing out with this new piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So you don't really want to cut them off too soon. There's also a lot of other research about like, you know, transfers red blood cells and iron and nutrients and all that kind of stuff. But really it, it just makes sense to keep them connected to their oxygen source. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, you know, baby gets, you know, still connected is usually laying on top of mom because that's as far as they can get. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also monitoring bleeding. So then the placenta has to come out. So that's actually the third stage of birth um, is literally the placenta. And we're always like, don't worry, it doesn't have bones, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not as big as your baby. Right. Um, but that can take um, 15 minutes sometimes. So we're actually actively waiting for that. So a lot of times like we're monitoring the baby while we're also monitoring this placenta about to come out, because that also means that once it's disconnected, the baby has to be stable by that point, right? Right. So that they've lost their supplemental oxygen source. I mean, we have an oxygen tank, but still, yeah. you know, physiologically, they've lost their supplemental oxygen source. Mm -hmm. And then you're monitoring mom's bleeding. Because so a placenta is like the size of a really big pancake. Mm -hmm. So when that comes off, that is literally the wound on the inside mm -hmm. of the mom's body that is bleeding. Wow. So, you know, think about a like a dinner plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that's the thing that we have to be concerned about is that wound. It's peeling it's off the uter inside the uterine wall, right? And yep. I'd imagine it's like, if that doesn't peel right, that can cause all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. So most, the, so worldwide, the ways that moms die are infection and hemorrhage. Um, luckily, we don't see infection as much in this country. It's pretty rare um, just because obviously a lot of hospital birth and just other practices, you know, even in out of hospital settings, sterile mm -hmm. equipment, all that. Um, but hemorrhage is still the number one reason why women experience major complications after the birth. Um, mm -hmm. And the major pieces, as it's peeling off, the uterus is also this like crazy strong muscle. It's still contracting. So it should also start shrinking as, and then, which means it'll shrink the wound and literally like stop, you know, the hemorrhage from that wound as it's peeling off. So that's the way it's oh, meant to wow. happen, right? Okay. But if you can imagine that like after a long labor, the uterine muscle is still a muscle. It's freaking tired, right? I'm mean, just yeah. think about like how your legs move after you like trash them after a workout or something. You're like, you can't even walk down the stairs. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, after like right. 24 hours of labor and birth, which is pretty normal for a first time parent, that muscle is pretty cached. So that's the other reason why, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult to stop that. But midwives carry um, medications that can control bleeding. So those are all things that like, that are happening that like parents might see, right? So, you know, especially if you're, you know, your audience is listening and they're thinking about like, what would I see after the birth and why it feels so busy and so hectic right around when the baby comes out? Cause that's what's happening. You know, they're basically mm -hmm. managing two extremely vulnerable people in that moment you know, making sure one person knows how to use their new equipment and one person's equipment is still working. Right. Right. Wow. Um, and then after that, you know, assuming bleeding is normal, placenta comes out, you know, baby's crying, everyone's cuddling in an out of hospital situation. We just tuck everybody into bed. Um, and then babies get to breastfeed, which is, you know, if they, if that's what the parents' plans are. And I'll say that for most of the people and, you know, who are coming to midwifery care, I would say, 99% have some intention to breastfeed. Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to promote that as much as possible. There's lots of great stuff out there about um, <clears throat> breastfeeding and how important it is for babies. And, you know, we all talk about that, all that, stuff. but there's actually a lot of really cool benefits for the mom. You know, even if they don't decide to breastfeed long-term, um, there's a lot of really cool chemicals that they get like oxytocin, um, that helps with their uterine contractions. 
so that they don't bleed, um, but it also helps with their mood. So in terms of preventing postpartum depression. So it's, you know, even if people don't plan on doing it all the time or, you know, or at all for long term, um, there's definitely a reason to at least start it right after the birth. So what, what do you recommend? How long should, should a baby be breastfed? What do you recommend? As long as people can manage it. Oh, really? <laughs> is my party line. Okay. Um, you know, I work with a lot of people who struggle with breastfeeding. You know, yeah. it's, um, so it's one of those things where I, I'm always really careful about, like, I want this for you and your baby, and I don't want it so badly that you're going to punish yourself to be yes. able to do it. Right. Um, right. And because it's punishing work. I mean, labor and birth are hard, but they're over in a day or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, I breastfed my son for a little over two years, but like full on, he was breastfed for like six months yeah. or so. And then, you know, then he's eating food and all that kind right. of stuff. Um, but I mean, I was working 80, hundred hours a week. I was pumping all the time. Uh -huh. he, he was getting milk, but you know, yeah, it's hard too. work. Yeah. It's really hard work. Yeah. <laughs> and it's you like nobody else can do that for you. Right. I mean, you can pump and hand someone the bottle, but you still have to pump, you know, I'm like, well, it didn't save me any time. I still have to get up at three in the morning to make that happen. You know? Right. So, like I'd rather just you hand me the baby and I'm going to feed again. But in um, an optimal, in an optimal world though, as yeah. a, as a physician, you would say, mm -hmm. yeah, just let your baby wean itself then I guess if, if everything is fine yeah. and you can manage it. Yeah. I mean, I think that there, so I see also see the other end of things. Like I see a lot of families who do what we call extended breastfeeding. So in the conventional realm, they talk about extended breastfeeding as beyond one year of life. Mm -hmm. um, internationally, they mean beyond two years. So I definitely see families who, you know, who breastfeed longer than that. Um, at that situation, it, yes, there are potentially still benefits. Like, I mean, breast milk has immune protection for babies, no matter what, but like, um, the nutritional benefits and all that have drastically reduced. So at that point, it's really more just about like the relationship than it is more about the biochemical benefits. So yeah. I just tell people like, you know, try to at least get through six months um, because from a nutritional standpoint and immune protection standpoint, that's when they're the most vulnerable. Right. Um, yeah. And if you can make it through a year, um, then you've also helped them get through the most vulnerable time of their life statistically. Um, but the World Health Organization recommends up to two years. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, so but it, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's hard work. So, you know, I'm always kind of like, take it one month at a time, take it one day at a time. <laughs> right. You know, and, and I imagine and there's some women who maybe the, you know, just, just can't for whatever reason, yeah. breastfeed, right? So there's options mm -hmm. out there for them also Absolutely. with how they want to do that. I mean, yeah. I've, I've, I've had patients like that where, for whatever reason, they can't breastfeed. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and, uh, there's a lot of reasons. And I think that that's where partners, family members can come in. You know, that's the part that people really need a lot of support around. So if there's a thing to really get educated about, it's breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Like, how does this work? Like, how often does it happen? How long do babies feed? What right. do breastfeeding parents need to be supported? Like, that's where you can come in and be really supportive. Okay. Um, where you can't actually do the breastfeeding for them, but you can do all this other stuff that makes it possible for them to be successful and yeah. keep and keep your baby alive because <laughs> right. that's what they're doing when they're feeding them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I um, so I've had a number of men throughout, <laughs> family members included, who have gone into the birthing process with their wife, not knowing what to expect right. to see when the baby comes out. <laughs> and when they see their baby, their son or daughter, freak the hell out because it looks gray, blue, dead. Yep. The, the head is completely deformed. They think, yep. you know, <laughs> they, th <laughs> they think they've given birth to or helped give birth to a monster. And <laughs> I had, it's my, I'm laughing because my cousin went through this and had no mm -hmm. idea what he was going through. <laughs> so can you just talk briefly about the shape of the head when... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. I mean, the best analogy that I can think of is like I think about the cone heads from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> right. They really right. do look like that. Like their heads are completely misshapen and pointed. Um, and they look like they went through a boxing match. I mean, their <laughs> eyes are right. puffy and swollen yeah. and red. Um, and usually like their jaws kind of off to one side. Um mm. 
and and also like their skin color and this also somewhat depends on um their actual pigmentation too yeah. um can be really mottled like kind of splotchy mm-hmm. so i mean they look they look like they're dying like they don't actually look like yeah. a new live human they and, and that's like- and that's what my that's what my mm-hmm. uh cousin was talking about he, he yeah. had leave because he was so upset <laughs> until somebody yeah. pulled him aside <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's good to prepare people for that visually. I mean, some people watch videos and all that. And some people are like, no, 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 that's too much. You know, I don't need to see all that, but I think it's good to know. Um, and just that, um, you know, maybe you don't have the stomach for it, but you do actually have to like hang in there because the other person doesn't have a choice about that. So (laughs) you gotta have to stay right there. Right. Right. Support them. So figure out a way that you're going to do that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They can go back to the doula, Brian. Right. Brian. Right. Exactly. That's what we need to (laughs) Yep. (laughs) We need. Um, I just tell people like pull up a chair right alongside your, like your partner's like face and like stay just up top over there and just like look at their face and their eyes and, you know, And just stay connected to that person because that will keep you anchored in the room. Yeah, and you're, you're like, yeah, oh my I can god, imagine. this is crazy. Yeah, and right, you're just perfect. like, listen, Step trust on. me, you want to stay up top. Look at your wife. <laughs> make sure she gets. Don't don't look at what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, you know what I? I mean, I think it's cool for people to see the whole birth process, but in that moment, um, it might not be honestly. Yeah. you know. Yeah, um, it depends on the per the the person, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's cool because I, you know, whatever, this is what I do. And I don't think it's weird or, you know, traumatic or anything, but I mean, right. everyone is really raw. Everyone is experiencing oxytocin. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even though it's not coursing through his body, he's mm-hmm. still actually subject to a lot of the same like energy and chemicals in the room. So it's good yeah. to also, I really like to kind of cocoon and protect the family as much as possible. You know, and a lot of that is just like bring the baby up to parents and just let them sit together you know with their baby um and don't pay attention to what's going on down there not because it's like gross or bad it's actually kind of cool you know so i'm always careful about like it's not that it's gross or bad you're not allowed but just go go be where you're needed you know yes right go start being a dad right Um, because that's where it starts right there so yeah yeah. go be where you're capable of being (laughs) yeah although there is actually um a couple of cool articles out there that dads Mm -hmm. that are really um uh, involved in the birth Mm-hmm. And especially dads who actually help catch their babies, yeah, um, are even more connected as fathers and have like oh, and they sort of trace yeah, those relationships sense. over time. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. I mean, it's super powerful. But I've had a number of dads like they weren't ready the first time, but then when it came to like baby number two, three, well, in one case it was baby number four, and baby came out four minutes or five minutes after she called me. So. Wow. I was, I was in the car. On right. So phone, he's the one who caught and it. And he caught the baby. And I mean, and everything was fine and great. And you know, this was yeah. baby, actually baby number five for them. And then, uh, so I'm pulling up and he's running out the door. He's like, that was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I was yeah. like, I know this is why we can stay up all night. Cause it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's neat. That's yeah. one of the benefits of natural childbirth, though, right? Like you can yeah. hand the baby right over to the. Mm-hmm. I, I, well, I, do they do that in the hospital too now? Because I always I hear stories where yeah. they immediately take the baby away from you, and you don't see it for mm-hmm. a few hours or or for as many hours. I don't know how long it takes. But one a, woman told me it was like hours before she hours. got to meet her her baby. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's um, it's still pretty common practice in a lot of hospitals around the country. What, that what's the point? The of baby's that? born, yeah. they cut the cord, and they bring the baby to the warmer. And like, oh, you do know that the mom is literally like 120 degrees. She just ran a marathon. Like there yeah. is no warmer place on earth than her body right now. What? So <laughs> She's yeah. literally pouring in sweat. Like, <laughs> What's the purpose um, of that then? I, I don't, is it's, it? So that they can, I mean, it's, there's so many pieces of that, right? Like oh, they okay. have a respiratory therapist, a neonatologist and a pediatric nurse, and they're evaluating the baby. And then they have the obstetrician and a labor and delivery nurse, and usually a second labor and delivery nurse, and they're evaluating the mom. It's really that division of two patients, and then they've created two teams, and then they they separate the patients. And so there's this, it was actually an article that I just read two days ago, about how some hospitals are doing this novel thing as looking at moms and babies as a dyad, like as one patient. Right. And managing them together in the same spot rather than splitting babies and mothers. And I was like, oh, wow, novel idea. (laughs) Keeping children and parents together, weird. Um, And it's really possible to do all the things that they're doing for the baby over there on the warmer. They can Mm -hmm. do all of that right there. 
on the baby's chest. So I think that's also a good thing for parents to know is that like, hey, is there anything that you're doing over there short of like if the baby actually needs um, major assistance with breathing, like mm -hmm. um, oxygen and ventilations and things like that, then it, right. you do actually need to lay them on a flat surface in order to do that. Okay. So a mom's body will not work for that. But, um, but everything else they can do right on mom. They can listen to the baby's heartbeat while the baby's laying on mom's chest. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually show the babies regulate their breathing and their heart rate much more quickly when they're in contact with heart beats and, and respiratory rates that are already regulated, right? Yeah. So yeah. That, you know, we know that like the heart is an electrical organ and it will automatically sync um, mm -hmm. kind of almost like, you know, Bluetooth or wireless technology yeah, um, that yeah. when you lay them next to each other, like the baby's heart rate will sync much more quickly and will the respiratory rate will sync much more quickly when they're close to each other. Yeah, and that must have, you would think, profound impacts mentally, mm -hmm. emotionally, you would think, right? Like, yeah. I don't know, as a, as a newborn baby, I can't, I, you know, I just imagine you have no idea you're in this warm, safe place, and then yeah. you come out to bright, bright lights or come out to this whole different environment. It's like walking through a wormhole almost and going into another universe. Oh, yeah. And, and, then, and then you feel, if you're not with your mom or, or some, something of comfort, you know, you feel completely alone. I mean, I think that'd be yeah. terrifying for, for anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think most adults Certainly. would never put themselves in that situation. You're like, if you woke up, you're like in your bed and you're all warm and cozy and your blankets and it's dark. And then all of a sudden, like someone rips back the covers and it's a big, scary clown or something like that. And then blows <laughs> a horn in your face and you're like, ah! <laughs> right. I was like, right. that's pretty much what really being born is like for babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And most adults would never sign up for that. So it's just sort of interesting that we're, we're okay with like these very fresh new people mm -hmm. um, to experience that. But also I think it's parents don't realize that they have choice in that, you know, that they can say they're like, Hey, I want my baby with me. Right. Um, and unless my baby's in distress, you can actually come and do the whole exam right here. Um, you know, on, on, while the baby's on my body. Oh, okay. It's totally wow. possible to do that. But you know, this is all also about, training and turf and all that kind of stuff too you know i mean it's it's not the way physicians are trained in the hospital so right mm -hmm. it's not it's not comfortable for them what what so if somebody's interested in being a midwife where mm -hmm. where would they get training where could they get yeah. training in the u.s because I, I don't know of yeah. many places that formally train midwives apparently at the um, jugs machine because so you keep saying about, catch the baby <laughs> <laughs> apparently at the jugs machine like a receiver so you can catch the baby <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> yeah well i mean depending on the state you don't have to have um, yeah. you can just show up and catch babies right and you know trade um, but i wouldn't recommend that i'm not really in favor of that at all. Like, that if you're going to care for human life yeah um, you should be properly trained and really understand how human physiology works, biochemistry, like really also have a very sound ground in medical knowledge. Like we have medical science and it's cool. Right. You know, history is not antagonistic to medical science. It's, it's part of it. Um, right. And I think the midwife should actually really understand it and be really firmly grounded in research and data. And um, because that's only going to improve what we do. Right. So right. there's a lot of, pro there's about uh, 10 midwifery programs, accredited midwifery programs it's three full years of didactic and clinical training. Um, wow. And over the course of those three years, you're also training clinically um, as a student in someone's site, you know, so you're working alongside a midwife, um, attending births, doing prenatal visits, you know, really doing everything firsthand with your hands yeah. um, for two years. So, I mean, when I was training as a midwife, I was on call for two years straight, 24 seven. Yeah. I had um, two weeks off that entire time where right. I was not on call. Wow. Um, I went to 150 some births during that time wow. um, and took care of probably a thousand different people because, you know, you, you provide prenatal care for a lot of people whose births you don't necessarily attend also. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, there's a lot there. I mean, just numbers wise, you see and put your hands on and care for a lot of people. Um, Bastyr University, where I trained and then also where... Um, well, I don't teach in the midwifery program currently, but taught in the midwifery program for like 10 years. Um, they also have a master's level program. So then when people graduate from that program, they're also receiving a master's degree. 
So people are able to do actually like a, a master's thesis, like a research project. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, or we've created another sort of like clinical track for people related to um, botanical medicine. So they can actually do a clinical track with botanical medicine and childbirth. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that as well, but that's the only program like that where people actually graduate with a master's degree. I'm so curious if the wow. baby's premature, does that, mm -hmm. then is it still except, you know, is it possible to still use a midwife or does that kind of rule that out? Does it make it more That rules that out. Yeah. Okay. So I, for, I didn't mention that piece is there's like, so your due date, when people talk about your due date is mm -hmm. the equivalent of what we call 40 weeks um, and 37 weeks. So like three weeks before your due date mm -hmm. until two weeks after is sort of the window of when babies are low risk. Right. And fair, you know, any day is a good day to be born before 37 weeks is considered preterm. Okay. Um, now a 36, 36 week old baby might be just fine, you know, mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. no issues. Statistically, it just, it increases a little bit more at that time. And then for sure, once they get to 34 weeks and earlier, Absolutely um, those babies will often need some assistance with breathing yep. um, just because the lungs aren't fully formed at that point um, or with blood sugar stabilization. So they, that vulnerable transition is harder for them. So yeah. it is safer for them to be born where they have access to a NICU. Okay. But then you did mention that you carry some sort of uh, medication, like the clotting medication. So I guess midwives yeah. are able, depending on the state, to dispense yep. medication? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we have a pretty great scope here in Washington. It's not true for all states, but I mean, we carry um, three different medications to control hemorrhage. Um, we carry IV fluids, and so we can put in IVs if people are dehydrated or, um, or if after, after someone's had a baby and they've lost a little blood, we just want to put more fluids back in their body more quickly. Um, we can also put those hemorrhage medications into the IV as well, um, so we can get it into their system a little faster in addition to injecting it. Okay. Um, we can also give them antibiotics. So there's this thing called group B strep that some people test for at the end if people have it, um, which is a normal bacteria in all of our bodies, um, it can cause respiratory infections for babies. So we carry the antibiotics also that we can put into the IV in labor. So it's kind of like pre-treating the mom and getting rid of that bacteria so that the baby doesn't have to be born through it and potentially get it in their lungs. Oh, okay. um, we carry vitamin K, which helps them clot the babies, help clot their blood afterwards. Mm -hmm. which we talked a little bit about in the circumcision yeah. talk is, you know, one of the things that they have to have on board. Um, eye ointment to prevent um, infections only in the instance where moms have sexually transmitted infections, but you know, um, other infections can also be prevented that way. Um, hep B vaccine. So typically in the hospital, that's something that they administer right after the birth. Um, if parents opt for it. So we have the ability, we can carry that and administer that if families want that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, epinephrine in case people have allergic reactions to anything, something called tributylene to stop contractions if babies are in distress. I mean, so we carry a lot of, we carry a lot of stuff. Yeah. Very actually. medically trained. Um, in addition to oxygen. I mean, so there's, so it's not also completely unmedicalized to, right. to be out of the hospital. Right. Um, but luckily we don't need to use that stuff very often, which is cool. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. But not so all we, states get to do that. So. Right. <laughs> Well, that, yeah. that's the thing. So as a consumer, you know, if you're really yeah. thinking about this and want to go mm -hmm. a safe way, I mean, I, I don't know, I would think, look, look to states like Washington State to possibly have your baby in, right? If right, possible. exactly. Like if you can fly yeah. to Washington State and have your baby here or Oregon or, you know, right. California, um, like Colorado recently changed their laws. I have a good friend who lives there and in between her first and second baby, their laws changed in terms of what midwives could carry. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> And I was like, you could just road trip up here and yeah. Yeah. that way if you need any of this stuff, I can I can give it to you. Yeah. I just can't legally give it to you in Colorado. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's you know, it's silly too, right? Because those are things that would help keep out of hospital birth safer. Absolutely. Right. So midwives should have access to that. So it's sort of an interesting way that they kind of like, you know, tie their hands in being able to provide safe care out of the hospital. <laughs> yeah. Unreal. Yeah. Fascinating. Thanks so much for being on. Do you, do you have any other things you want to, did we cover most of everything? I think we covered so many things. I'm sure there's <laughs> yeah. like 1 million other things we can talk about. If I do yeah. like well, we part have to. two, because you know, my favorite thing to talk about is postpartum, you know, postpartum well, I, is forever, right? I mean, I would, once you have a baby, you're always postpartum. 
Right, um, right. Postpartum depression rarely happens in those first few weeks. Um, it's actually very commonly diagnosed like nine months to a year later. Yep. Um, so I think that there, there's so many other things, like especially when you're talking about like families and partnerships and mm-hmm. you know, what you're really working on is that, well, really, you're really working on the rest of your life, but that next year is kind of, um, has a lot of big stuff coming up in it. Well, I would love, I know Brian would too, love to get you back on and talk about the postpartum part of it all. That'd be <laughs> yes. cool at some point. Well, thank you so much. All right. Yeah, you're uh, so welcome. Yeah, I'm so, so appreciative for you being on. This is number three and they've been incredible for, for us and everybody else. Yeah. So thanks again. Awesome. Yeah, can, we, uh, can we, um, I, I guess, Brian, we we want to have something like maybe the website, the accredited website, where maybe people can go to figure yeah. out if they really want this care. They can go there and yeah, oh yeah, be able to I find can a midwife website for NACPM Meek um, Citizens for Midwifery is actually a really great website that's okay. compiled specifically for consumers. So that's where they post a lot of the research, the data. You know, what does it mean to be you know, like to be safe and out of the hospital like all of that kind of stuff that'd be great Perfect. so when we post it we i just well, let's post have that along. on it's the in the show notes yeah, yeah it's, okay cool. okay cool awesome all right thanks again give everybody my love sanita all right i'll, I'll all see right, you soon thank you, all right, you. Bye.